We have all heard of AI slop. I've seen someone receive an email, copy it into ChatGPT, copy the response, and then reply with that response. No editing. I've had collaborators before uh, hand me a piece of work and I look at it and I'm like, did you use AI for this? Like, why are you using AI for this? It's extremely easy to spot AI text if that text is sufficiently long or sometimes even a single sentence because AI writes so strangely. But it gets worse than your friends collaborating with you or people doing, you know, sort of harmless tasks. Take this article, for example, a scientific article, a peer-reviewed article, where this paragraph opens in the introduction, certainly, here is a possible introduction for your topic. This is a published piece of work. Or maybe even worse, I'm very sorry, I don't have access to real-time information or patient-specific uh, information as I am an AI language model. Or perhaps sillier and maybe a little bit harder to spot the regenerate response at the end of a paragraph in a piece of academic literature. I recently had a referee of an article um, I submitted for peer review um, say that my article was written with good scientific English without really engaging with the article at all in their entire report. Let's just say my referee reports have always been a little bit strange that I get back, but they've been getting weirder and weirder. Oh, how deep is this problem? Are scientists leaning on AI too much? Is AI deeply penetrating into the peer review process? And when will science just be AI chatbots reacting to articles written by AI chatbots. So let's start with me. I'm a scientist. Nothing like a statistically insignificant anecdotal piece of evidence. I use AI every day for what I think is mostly uh, sort of sort of safe use cases of AI. I do computational physics, so AI helps me code. You know, simple things, getting quick help, reminding me of syntax, helping me install Linux packages for things that I need. Or for example, in everyday life, I'm sort of a disaster. I don't have a lot of practical uh, skills. So I also ask it uh, to help me with basic tasks or sometimes to generate ideas for things like dinner. Aside from these relatively safe ways of using AI, I don't use AI to help me write. And I also don't use AI for anything that resembles uh, my interactions with uh, other human beings. I'm not letting AI read my emails. I'm not letting it help me respond. And I'm certainly not asking AI to proofread scientific articles or help me read articles that I'm refereeing. AI right now, at its current level of capability, is really good at small, uh, mostly trivial tasks that might be tedious, uh, might take a little bit of Google searching for you to figure it out on your own, but they're tasks that are hard to get wrong. They just accelerate what would have been tedious work for the human. Now, this isn't just a sort of like hard stance on AI from me. I just don't, uh, I don't personally have issues with those tasks. I'm sure there is something useful about AI checking grammar, AI generating ideas. You know, there's always writer's block. You know, getting an introduction started is typically almost the hardest part of writing a scientific paper. Responsibility is on the user to make sure the tool is being used correctly. And just as a as, as a personal aside, uh, the these uh, AI chatbots, these LLMs are incredibly energy um, and money intensive. It costs tens of millions of dollars for ChatGPT to handle people um, saying thank you uh, to the chatbot. Uh, certain tasks like geometric reasoning or, or different things like this um, that the AI still are very bad at, um, those types of queries um, into the AI can cost up to $3,000. So aside from the fact that the AI isn't great uh, at a lot of the things people are currently using them for, they're also extremely um, expensive um, and energy intensive. Don't get me wrong, I use them. They are actually extremely useful. 
when used correctly and responsibly. A lot of people, however, don't really see it uh, the way I see it. A lot of people uh, are already trusting the AIs to do a lot more for them uh, that uh, I'm currently not comfortable with. You know, helping them referee scientific articles, helping them write pieces of their scientific article that they want to publish, um, and potentially even helping them reason in different, more complex um, areas. And it's it's not because these people um, probably don't see uh, the issues with um, AI and they don't see the current limitations. I think an interesting question to ask yourself if you've ever been through academia or spoken to academics is who um, have you ever come across that would be the prime victim um, of any company promising to make your workflow more efficient. In my opinion, aside from maybe, you know, um, you know, high-end business, business executives or, or something like this, I think a prime victim for this or the, the prime uh, target of products like this might be scientists. Scientists are people who are generally expected to, in general, teach several classes, do novel research, supervise several uh, projects, um, sit on committees, contribute to administration, write grants, review articles, um, and so on. There's a lot on um, an individual scientist's plate uh, at any given time. Lots of context switching, lots of menial tasks that AI at a glance can help you with. So it's extremely unsurprising to me that scientists are extremely tempted um, to start inserting more and more AI into their workflow um, and into the tasks that they're currently working on. So very clearly, um, AI is on the rise. And, and this isn't just anecdotal. So a really good piece of evidence was generated uh, by a librarian and researcher named Andrew Gray. So Andrew looked into trends in the literature, trying to track the use of AI across many, many different pieces of literature generated by academics. Sort of tracking AI slop, if you will. To quickly look at Andrew's results and what he found, let's quickly look at the plot that tells us how many articles were being indexed by his library or his, or his methods over the years. Specifically, the, the interesting thing to note here is that from 2022 to 2023, the numbers of articles um, actually dropped. Anyone who works in, in long-term projects and was around in, uh, in academia during uh, COVID-19 surely knows that this is almost surely a result of uh, you know, decreased scientific output um, during, during the COVID-19 era. So if you were to assume that each word for every single year would be roughly about equal probable. So there would just be some fixed frequency of a word appearing and how many times it would appear would depend in almost entirely on how many articles were written. Then you would assume that the word's usage would go up with the amount of articles being published and it would go down if the number of articles went down. So, so anyone who's used AI knows that they like to use very specific words. So Andrew chose to track control words that are not commonly associated with AI. And sure enough, you look at the trend of these words, they look approximately like the trend of articles. So some of these curves don't quite look that way, but um, as we'll see, like the fact that they don't look like that isn't uh, statistically significant. But look at this plot. This result tells us a different story. From 2022 to 2023, we see that um, AI-associated words tell a much different story. Despite total number of papers going down, most of these words went up. So the percentage change for the control words looks very reasonable. There's not a lot of change over the years. It's really the total number of publications um, that is telling you how often a single word is being used. The amount of change associated with uh, AI words um, or words that AIs favor is very clearly statistically significant. People are using AI-generated text in scientific articles at potentially alarming rates. And right now, I feel like the community doesn't really know how to feel about this. Different scientific journals have come to different conclusions about how to handle this. For example, certain journals have completely banned AI-generated text, no idea how they're going to uh, check that. And others, AI-generated text is fine, but you have to disclose the fact um, that it was used. To be honest, on this front, I, I'm not really sure where I stand. AI tools 
um, just aren't good enough to engage at the level I expect uh, from engagement from scientists. Now, there, there's a lot of things that probably underpin the misuse of AI in this space. I mean, first of all, uh, AI is a new technology um, to all of us. It's not always clear that what the AI has generated um, is incorrect. And across the board, human beings are incredibly lazy. So if something looks approximately correct, um, that's often going to slip through the cracks. Like the A AI presents an incredible temptation for people. This observation underpins um, a deeper problem that has always existed in academia. Anyone who's ever been in academia knows that there is a core issue in academia that hasn't been addressed for decades. Currently, the academic system um, extracts a lot from scientists. Teach high quality classes. Go find the university funding for your uh, research. Sit on our committees uh, so we understand, you know, what is important, where the university should be focusing its effort, um, train the next generation of scientists, whether that means uh, giving pe undergraduates projects or taking on graduate students or taking on postdocs, you know, generate uh, high quality um, and novel research. This this requires a significant amount of literature knowledge. So it's a lot of reading and it's a lot of either work in the lab or work at your desk. There really is a publish or perish uh, mentality in modern science. And of course, there's also traveling to conferences. The best ideas are generated through collaboration. So you're also being asked to you know, not only work significantly more than most people would work at their jobs, but also um, travel to uh, travel to conferences, disrupting your everyday life, you know, all the time. You're also asked to referee uh, research articles. Um, this is done for free on your own time. Um, and this is the sort of community effort to make sure that the peer review process, you know, actually happens and make sure that rigorous good science gets published. And all of these things are done uh, with little to no support for the individuals uh, completing these tasks. Typically in more complex organizations in the private sector, there are typically teams responsible for individual tasks that academics are supposed to complete on their own. No compensation for refereeing, for example, relies on the goodwill of scientists to not completely phone it in every time they need to referee something. And frankly, um, it's probably a bit better than 50-50, but to be honest, referee B is almost always completely confused about what the article is about, barely engages with it, and either leaves nasty comments um, or basically phones it in and says, yes, this is good enough uh, to publish. There are fantastic uh, referees. Referee A uh, is almost surely always the editor's uh, first choice, and this person usually does engage deeply with the literature. Grant writing, I mean, it's different everywhere, but I have to say everywhere that I've seen it, it's it's a bit silly. You know, typically uh, a person is hired to a university um, to bring expertise in a specific area of interest. So for example, you could imagine a university trying to hire a quantum computing expert. And then the moment this person is hired, the university then turns to them and says, okay, now go apply for grants uh, to fund the research that we hired you for. And I understand that this process isn't simple. It's, it's an extremely complex task to allocate a country's budget or in, the, in some cases the European Union's budget in, in such a way that the right projects um, get funded. Grants are one of the many tasks that uh, academics are, are asked to do that uh, can often eat up a month or two of a researcher's time. And depending on the grant, they might have to do that every year. So it is unsurprising to me that the current system has people incredibly tempted uh, to basically use AI slop or AI generated text, if you don't want to be super negative about it, um, to alleviate some of the bottlenecks of, uh, of their workload. So this is getting a bit ranty, but all of this is to say is that um, it's a bad thing that so much AI is, is seeping into the scientific process. AI is certainly being used um, in a lot of cases uh, for use cases that are currently 
beyond its current uh, capabilities. It's likely affecting the quality of academic literature, scientific literature. It's almost surely affecting the quality of research itself. You know, there's positive sides, right? Like there's positive sides of computational work is now easier, uh, but you have to check that the AI generated um, correct code. But there's also downsides, right? Where people are um, basically verbatim copy and pasting AI generated text into scientific, uh, into scientific work. So AI is here. It's not leaving. It will almost certainly, uh, be a net force for good in science. But as of right now, the, the, the current trends are a little concerning. Science should not be a process of AI talking to itself. But anyways, this uh, video was a bit ranty. Uh, it was sparked off by the referee reports uh, I recently received. Uh, and frankly, I got a bit concerned about this topic. So I started reading a little bit um, about it. Uh, but anyway, um, if you liked the video, uh, feel free to like, subscribe, or leave a comment below.